Hi everyone, uh, my name is John. Ah, thank you. Um, I'll get started. Thanks for the, uh, the, the encouragement and applause. Uh, my name is John Kasagun. I'm one of the co-founders at Enigma and I'm also the chief product officer. Um, it's very exciting to be here today um, to uh, share uh, this event with you. We're going to uh, talk a bit about, so I'm going to do an intro, just um, we mentioned all, all about developers here. I'm not one, so I'm going to keep it short. Uh, I'm just going to give an intro on who we are uh, and why we do what we're doing. And I'm going to pass it over to Fred, who will go over the details of our network, actually like the next release that's coming up. And it's very exciting because we have never shared it publicly yet. So it's, it's very exciting to share it with you and hopefully get feedback from you. Um, so yeah, uh, looking forward to it. Um, cool, so let's get started. So at Enigma, we're building um, the, um, the privacy layer for the new internet. And um, I'm gonna tell you a bit about what that means and why that's important before I kick it off to uh, Fred. But uh, just to give you some background, we started uh, our research in 2015 while we were students at MIT. And at the time, um, we were all very intrigued by the idea of decentralization. Um, and we got into blockchain research and soon after we realized while blockchains are a, a very in, innovative technology, it kind of falls short uh, in terms of full decentralization. Um, and, and that's because blockchains are made for correctness and decentralized trust, but that comes at a cost. Uh, cost being uh, this notion of data has to be visible to everyone. And, um, and uh, this creates some, we believe this creates major problems in terms of future uh, adoption uh, of this technology. And I'm going to give you two examples. One uh, from something that we currently see today, and one of a more longer term uh, promise that people talk about. Uh, the shorter term approach is around governance on, on, um, on blockchain projects. As you know, voting becomes a big part in most of these protocols when decisions have to be made. Uh, but one problem with governance as is right now, uh, whenever there's a voting uh, that takes place on, um, on these protocols, uh, Ethereum had one about the mining reward, had one about the, uh, the, the DAO refund, right? All the votes you're casting are visible to everyone. That's not ideal for um, anonymity, uh, but it's also actually very dangerous because if I at some point know what way you're voting, I can create a contract and fund it so that as long as you vote the way I want you to vote, you'll get some money. So this becomes, uh, this makes contra uh, bribery uh, contractual. And as you can see, it's like very, very, uh, non uh, you know, it doesn't work for a well-defined governance system. And then like more so on the longer term, people talk a lot about blockchain being the, uh, the holy grail like, that, that would give people control over, over their own data or the fact that it can like, uh, disintermediate these uh, middlemen uh, in the in the marketplaces that we see, such as things like Uber. But like, if you think about potentially having a social network on a blockchain, all your friends, all your interactions, everything you do is visible to everyone. And if you're doing something like an Uber on a blockchain, then your location, your destination, how much money you have, whoever you uh, transacted with, all that becomes publicly visible to everyone. And that becomes more of a kidnapping app than a, than a transportation app. So uh, that is the, the, the limitation that we see with blockchains and, and we're trying to work on the solution that would enable privacy for true decentralization. What we're building is a privacy protocol uh, that enables computations over encrypted data. That means you never see what data you're working on, but you can still run an analysis and, and reach a consensus on the result. We're introducing this concept called secret contracts uh, secret contracts are very, very similar to smart contracts that we know from Ethereum. The only difference is the inputs that goes into that contract do not have to be visible to the entire network, but you can still reap the benefits of all the decentralized, all, all the promise of blockchain without oversharing your sensitive or private data. Uh, the way we do it is uh, by leveraging two uh, different techniques. One is called uh, multi-party computation, which I will refer to as MPC. And the other one is hardware-based trusted execution environments. We started our research with uh, MPC back in the day. However, this first version of our net uh, work that uh, Fred is going to introduce 
is based on trusted execution environment. And that was a decision that we made so that we could target more a broader range of applications and get something out there that people can use uh, faster. Um, that said, MPC is still a big part of our network. Security, we're, we're using MPC for our key management in the current version of the network. And in the future releases, we'll have secret contracts that are powered uh, solely by uh, multi-party computation. Um, with that, I want to give you some color on uh, the kind of uh, projects that we're working with uh, and, and what's exciting to us right now. I already talked about governance and why we believe privacy is key for governance. Um, we're working with projects like Aragon, Civil, um, Crypto Against Humanity, Ocean Protocol um, to help them better do governance on their uh, projects. We are about to start a, uh, a working group around, uh, what's going on? In the, in the meantime, any questions around what I, I discussed so far? So, is this uh, public or is this private? Is this permission? Uh, it's private, uh, it's public. Oh, it's, so it's on Ethereum? Uh, right now we're still test nets, uh, but yeah, the idea is, so all I'm telling you is, uh, Technically, we are uh, building right now as a side chain to Ethereum. Sorry, give us a second. We just need to switch the source to Ethereum. Yeah, and then the reason, can you guys do that? Uh, the reason why we're, we're doing that is because um, like, there's a lot of activity on Ethereum, and we would like to tap into uh, the, the, uh, the use cases that we see there, because people are actually building things there. And our goal is, right now we see a lot of uh, decentralized uh, application developers who build on Ethereum and then use Amazon for like certain things that they cannot have on Ethereum. And, and the goal is to be a side chain uh, where um, you know you can run computations that require privacy on Enigma network uh, while the, the, the main application is deployed on Ethereum and you add a level of decentralization and you're not stuck to things like Amazon. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's like a side chain? It's a side chain with consensus. Um, it can be its own chain in the future. Um, that's the way to see it. Uh, okay, so yeah, I was talking about governance. So we're starting this TCR working group. Who here is a, 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 um, familiar with TCRs? Okay, so TCRs are this, are this concept where you create uh, subjective lists and um, the management goes to a, a voting structure. Um, so we're, we're working with a bunch of projects that, uh, that want to define how their TCR should work and want to have uh, private voting there. Auctions is an area that we're interested in. Um, we believe auctions are going to be key when NFTs become more uh, popular. But currently, there's a company called Portal Network uh, that is doing auctions for ENS, uh, Ethereum name domains. Uh, and they are uh, implementing uh, our secret auctions contract. Uh, and with auctions, you can actually do, basically like when you can do auctions, you can build order books. And you can do private exchanges, which I'm going to talk uh, to you a bit in a bit. Uh, we're very excited about gaming in general. Uh, right now, any card game you play, you have to have the deck uh, hidden. Uh, you can't really do that right now. Um, so things like uh, like well, blackjack poker, whatever you have in mind, uh, or also like games where you know you have to go to a place and like figure out the reward. You don't need to, like you, you obviously don't want to know what that reward is before you get there. Um, so we're we're having conversations with projects like. Loon Network and the Central Land around enabling them implement some games that they cannot currently do on Ethereum right now. Uh, identity is very interesting. We're working with this company called Data Wallet. Uh, and what they do is they take your Facebook data and they own that data and they run some algorithms on it to determine with some confidence whether you're a human or a bot. So what we're enabling them to do is that we're turning that algorithm into a secret contract on Enigma. So your data doesn't go to this company, but it runs into our network in an encrypted way. We can still run the computation and let you know whether you are, or like let people know whether you're uh, an actual human or a bot. And that becomes interesting uh, for people who are running ICOs and want to limit bots, or people who run games uh, and want to make sure that one person per game uh, is, uh, is possible. Uh, private exchanges is something very interesting. I mentioned some auctions. Basically, if you can do two-sided auctions, you can create uh, a secret order book. Um, but what's more interesting is you can also do post-settlement privacy with Enigma, which means like you don't have to know who traded with whom. You just like know these trades are taking place. 
And then the last idea, which is a bit far-fetched, and I think we're a bit early for that, but you can create this concept called a secret ICO. The, the state of the Enigma network is encrypted. So you can run an ICO, or like you can create a token, let's not call it an ICO. You can create a token on the Enigma network, and the token will have Zcash-like properties. Um, so it's very interesting for people who want to build privacy preserving uh, tokens on us. And the reason kind of why I went to all this is my role at Enigma is to identify these use cases, uh, find teams who are working on these, or encourage people who want to work on these, and then um, collect, work with them basically to help them get to where they want to get. Because at the end of the day, our success metric is to have these things be built uh, on our network. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Fred, who will get into uh, our network uh, and more technical details. Uh, OK, <clears throat> uh, my name is Frederick. I'm an engineer with Enigma. Um, my goal here is to sort of give an overview of the architecture of our network. Uh, this is something that's still a work in progress. Uh, essentially, like the architecture that I'm describing is something that we're currently working on and building. And obviously, like we're still making some adjustments as we're building different pieces. Uh, and also, like, it's going to be pretty informal. Uh, it's the first time that I do this presentation. Um, so, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that I have it down very well. Uh, so it's going to be pretty informal. It's going to be me walking through some diagrams. And then uh, you guys can stop me at any time and ask me questions. So essentially, like, the level of granularity that I'm going to go to is largely going to depend on, on your questions. So, so don't hesitate to stop me and, and ask anything you want. OK, so um, this diagram here describes uh, what we call our MVP. So uh, one, more, one or two months ago, we released this um, MVT network. Um, and our attempt with doing that, or our goal with doing that, was to release kind of a proof of concept. So we created this simple network, which um, uses SGX Enclave to run uh, computations. So as John mentioned, at the moment we're using, we're running private computations using uh, SGX Enclaves, not yet a secure multi-party computation. And the goal of this MVT is to kind of prove that you know this can be done and kind of um, work out the details on how to do it. So basically, how to use Ethereum in conjunction with uh, Intel's remote SGX remote attestation process and come up with a co coherent architecture to essentially be able to run Ethereum computation uh, on SGX and submit some proofs and make sure these proofs are verifiable and stuff like that. So this is what our MVT focuses on. Uh, the implementation <laughs> is fairly simple. Uh, it can run computations that are included in functions of smart contracts deployed on Ethereum. So you could take your existing Ethereum smart contract and take one of the functions of your smart contract and encrypt some inputs, like on the user's side, encrypt some encrypt the inputs of this function, and then uh, specify that using a client library and dispatch that to our network. And then our network is going to take this set of instructions, um, locate the smart contract, locate the function, uh, and decrypt the input securely with, inside of an SGX enclave, and run the computation, and then commit the input back to Ethereum in, in a callback function, essentially. So that, that's kind of how it works right now. It works. And but there are some limitations, obviously. We haven't released it in, in any kind of public uh, testnet. So it's, in, this, in its current form, it's like a Docker network that you can use, and it works alongside with Truffle, you know, so you can run your local Ethereum blockchain. There's no concept of incentives or nodes or staking or anything like that, because it's like purely a developer release. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, the computations that are running are, are functions of Solidity smart contract or Ethereum black code deployed smart contracts. Uh, so, you know, you're limited to what you can code in there, and it's also stateless. So you can only run like stateless computations. And so far as you provide the inputs, the time of, of uh, requesting a, a computation test. So this is pretty much what we have right now. So it's it's a good proof of concept, but uh, we're definitely like improving a lot upon that and building something more mature. 
this is just kind of a okay. So uh, in this section, I'm going to cover the architecture of uh, discovery. So like our next Enigma dot next is called discovery. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay. So again, so like. What I want to do here is to walk through this diagram, essentially, and I'm going to explain box by box what it means with the hope that it's the right format to give you an idea of what we're building. Hopefully it is. Uh, maybe you tell me after if, if you understood something or if it's not the right format. Um, this diagram is fairly high level. We have some more detailed documentation, but I think it should do the job. Okay, so. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to run through the boxes and hopefully try to tie it together in a way that makes sense. Uh, okay, so here you see the word uh, secret contract. So essentially, uh, we're building our own smart contract engine. We call them uh, secret contracts for obvious reasons. They are meant to run private computations. Uh, so in our next version, it's no longer that it's no longer that we're computing functions of existing Ethereum smart contract. Like we have our own smart contract engine. So one could go and write uh, an Enigma smart contract. Uh, we use an existing, we're, like basically we're enhancing existing tools to do this. So in particular, we use uh, WebAssembly. So our smart contract engine is based on WebAssembly. It's a really interesting platform for us to work with. And also, it's a good platform that extends to the future where we uh, want to use like MPC because this it's it's easy like it, it's it's a good one so we can work with a compiler to compile for MPC and so forth. So we use that and uh, the smart contract uh, like language itself. Uh, what we do is we provide a a Rust library to do that. So the smart contracts will be written in Rust, and we provide a a library um, that will be used for you to like a crate essentially for those familiar with Rust to provide a crate which would be useful for one to author the smart contract and structure it like a stru like a smart contract would so basically in this library there are some, some macros or some annotations that are being used to say indicate uh, where the methods of this smart contract is and there's a particular structure that you need to respect to like store the state and so forth so this is roughly what our smart contract engine should look like yeah so does that mean that you have to rewrite only the smart contract from still being used? Uh, yeah, we, right now we're, we're sort of researching a bit uh, some clever way to be able to reuse the Solidity contract so that you would have an option of using either Solidity or Rust. Perhaps with Solidity you would have access to a subset of functionality. Uh, but I can promise you that we will release this on day one or not. Uh, but that's something that we're looking into. Um, yeah. Uh, but if not, then you would have to write your contract in Rust. Um, and, I, have a about it. Um, yeah. I understand that it needs to be written in Rust for faster execution, but does it need to be done in Rust so that it can be used on the Intel SGX essentially? No, I mean, first of all, like uh, the runtime is, is WebAssembly, so theoretically you would be able to use any language that compiles in WebAssembly. However, like I said, like our contracts need to respect a particular format. So in Rust, we offer a library. In the future, we might, we can easily like write one in C++ or write one in uh, C or even maybe TypeScript. I think TypeScript now compiles to WebAssembly with some, some kind of workarounds. So like we could take all of these languages that compile to WebAssembly and write a library essentially to help you structure your smart contract with that and also including Solidity. But Rust, is kind of our, our favorite language. That's the language we use to write our program also. And it's going to be like sort of the, the baseline language to write smart contract. But obviously, like we can extend it to anything because WebAssembly is like, for those who aren't familiar, uh, WebAssembly, it's kind of similar to the, to the Java virtual machine, something like that. Like it's, it's a, it's our LLVM, it's, it's a generic execution environment. And it's been built by uh, Mozilla at first. And <coughs> it's, now it now ships with most major browser as a standard. So it's actually ship it ships with Firefox and, and Chrome today, and it's being used to run like some uh, system programs in in the web browser. And there are other blockchain projects that are using it also. Like it's a really good uh, runtime environment that's fast that 
uh, that's easy to target and so forth. So anyway, um, one of the key characteristics also of the, of the smart contract, uh, of the secret contract, sorry, compared to the smart contract function implementation that we have right now in NVT, is that our secrets con secret contracts are gonna have a state. So you'll be able to write a secret contract and let's say save, uh, save an attribute, like suppose it's a class or suppose it's like a Solidity smart contract, you can save an attribute and use it later when you, when say another user wants to execute a function on the same secret contract. So, and that state will be encrypted. So we'll have uh, secret contracts with a state that is fully encrypted. And because of some efficiencies, uh, it's gonna be able to contain a lot more data than say an Ethereum smart contract. So we'll be able to like store more data uh, than you would on Ethereum uh, in the state and it's encrypted. Uh, mm. Yeah. Who's doing the encryption? Yeah. Uh, so essentially, it's it's this guy. So, like the way it works is we have some keys. So each. I don't want to jump too fast. So, so okay, let me jump oh, here right now. Yeah, I, I think I can do it now because that's where I was going anyway. So okay, this guy here, the worker. Uh, this, the worker is like a node of our network. So essentially what we're building is a network with multiple nodes and it's a decentralized network like similar to a blockchain, but it's not really a blockchain because it doesn't have a ledger and it uses Ethereum for final consensus. So it's more like another, ne uh, another network which works alongside with Ethereum. Uh, and each node of the network, we can call it, we can call it a worker and each worker has an SGX enclave, and that worker has some keys. So essentially, like the way it works is, we have, uh, just to simplify it, like each smart contract, each secret contract that, that's being deployed on the Enigma network um, originates a new key, let's call it a, a contract key, so every time you deploy a smart or a secret contract on Enigma network, there's a new key that's being uh, generated for that secret contract. And that key is being used for two things. One, for uh, to encrypt and decrypt the state so that we could store data about the state outside of an enclave uh, in regular storage on the worker's computer and it's securely put in there. Um, and uh, the other purpose of it is to decrypt the inputs. So say I'm a user here, I'm the DAP user, and I want to send a computation task, so we call it like, the terminology we're using is basically a task. So a task is like, think of it like a transaction on Ethereum. It's essentially the equivalent of calling a function of a secret contract. So whenever this guy here sends a task, or first of all, he's gonna send a task using Presumably, like we're building a, a JavaScript library, which is an extension of Web3. So presumably, he's sending a task using uh, JavaScript in, in whatever way, either with Node.js on the browser or whatever. Uh, and he's gonna encrypt the data from here. So there's a key management process where he's gonna go to the node of the Enigma network that he's connected to and request the encryption public key and the way that the encryption key works is that the private key of that contract encryption key is always locked inside of an SGX enclave. And I'll explain a little bit more what an enclave is like uh, in a second, but it, it's always locked inside of an enclave and it never leaves it unless it's encrypted and it goes to another, uh, another enclave. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, but that also means that uh, you have more of like a No, no, that's not, that's not correct. So essentially we are sharing keys, like the way that we're sharing keys is we're sharing keys amongst all of the nodes that have been selected to work on a particular contract. And I'll explain a little bit later about how the worker selection stuff works. Uh, but when I'm saying that it's locked in the enclave is because when we're sharing the key, we're sharing it like enclave to enclave. And in, in transit, it's encrypted. So no one can, can decrypt that 
uh, encrypted private key other than an enclave. And as far as the user goes, what it receives is the encryption public key. And what it does is that it takes it takes this encryption public key, and it it has it generates its own key pair, so like its user uh, key material. And then what it does is that it derives a key from the encryption public key and his own private key, and that's how he encrypts the data. So as a result, the data that that's being sent for computation from the client can be decrypted either by the user himself or by any node of the network that has the encryption key. Okay. Um, hopefully that makes sense to others. Um, so, yeah. So, 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 and okay. So that that was because I just explained a little bit what the worker is. So essentially, like, think of the essentially our network has nodes, a little bit like Ethereum has multiple nodes, and the concept of a worker is basically a node that's being selected to work on uh, a secret contract, and. Uh, for, for the purpose of this conversation, let's assume that, so I'm gonna explain how the worker selection stuff works. For the purpose of the conversation, let's assume that only one worker per smart contract gets selected at the time. That's not true, but it helps understanding the concept, and then I'll explain the, the, the differences at the end of the presentation. But let's assume for a moment that for every smart contract, there's only only one worker selected at once to work on it, which means that if you create like this, I don't know, voting secret contract and de you deploy it on Ethereum and you're a user and you start sending tasks to the um, Enigma network to do work on this voting secret contract, then that means that predictably there's only one worker that's going to work on this, on all of your tasks. And it's the selected worker, and you can know who it, it is, and you can you can verify it, and and so forth. So what we do is that for each epoch, which is uh, essentially it's a number, a configurable number of blocks on Ethereum, we change the worker who's assigned to a contract. So every epoch, essentially, we rotate and we select a new worker to work on, on each contract. Uh, actually, it's a group of worker, but you know. Like I'm gonna present as as if it's one now, uh, just for simplicity's sake. So that's the concept of worker. Essentially, a worker is a node of the network who's been selected to work on a particular secret contract for a period of time. And what determines what? So essentially, like you might ask, okay, you have a hundred nodes registered in the Enigma network. What determines which? node gets selected as a worker when, and essentially what we do is we do a random selection weighted by the amount of ENG token staked by each of the, the nodes. So if you want to register to be a node in the Enigma network, you have to stake some ENG token, and the more you stake, the more likely you are to be selected as a worker. And then when you get selected as a worker, what happens is that you get the computation fees, so essentially the gas that the, use, that the user, that each user pay to run the computation, essentially. So if I'm a node and I stake a lot of ENG, I might get picked as a worker frequently throughout the day, throughout the week or whatever. And whenever I'm picked as a worker for a period of time for each contract, any task that comes in directed towards a contract that I'm the selected worker for, I get all of the gas associated with that, essentially. That, that's how it works. So that, that's, that's how the worker selection uh, stuff works, and also that's how the economics work. Yeah? Uh, where does the registry of the workers? It, it's on Ethereum. So essentially, we create a kind of a, an Enigma registry contract on Ethereum, and that's and what... You use the registry to Come again? The randomization seed is produced somewhere else. The randomization seed is produced somewhere else, and what we use for for randomness, essentially, we use a property of of, of SGX that allows for randomness. So one of the properties of uh, of SGX is kind of a, they call it like a, a true randomness. Essentially, it uses the current of the chip to produce a random number. Um, and so we use that, and right now in our current implementation. Uh, this is temporary, but like right now we have one node that would 
um, generate a random seed for the rest of the network. This is kind of just a stopgap. But what we're working on is to have some kind of a, a consensus where multiple nodes might bid a random number and then something else uh, which is more inherent to the network determines which number is being picked. So like our goal is to generate like multiple random numbers uh, from multiple enclaves just in case, like just on the remote, you know, probability that an enclave gets compromised somehow. Right, but then the um, problem here is that it passes down predictions. If, if, they, if the seed, where the seed gets generated, is predictive, then I will attack that, right? So um, the better model is to have multiple random seeds and then combine that with the uh, Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about, yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, but then, further on, it's, isn't it a good idea to use the existing supporters to supply the randomness and take it back? Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Like, oh, we haven't exactly define the economics of random numbers because like I said right now like we're using this kind of a stopgap method where we simplify it with one node but you're correct in the future uh, there should be some reward for generating these random numbers mm. yeah or or, or 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 maybe it's a cost of business like if you don't then you don't get picked you know in that epoch or something like that but there, there, there will be economics tied to your obligation of generating generating a number mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so, I mean, how many workers can there be in this network? Come again? Uh, how, how many networks can there be in this network? Is it like global scale? Or yeah, it's infinite at the moment. We have we don't have any. Um, we haven't defined like a minimum sort of staking amount, right? Because remember, to be a worker, you have to stake some ENGs. So we haven't defined a minimum. Like we probably will, so that someone doesn't come in and stake like dust of ENG and sort of, but you know, it's not going to be a high, uh, it's not going to be a high barrier of entry, essentially. <clears throat> yeah. um, is there any penalty for dishonest nodes? And is there any like validators that check the work that's done by the computation to make sure it's accurate? Yeah, so the penalty, uh, we're still working on that a little bit. So I, I can't give you like an exact protocol, but we've thought about it. We're, we're looking at different ways of doing it. Uh, I have to say we're using SGX enclave, so it's not like we're like this gives us some guarantees. Uh, as long as the enclave is is um, uh, genuine, you know, we have some guarantees. And then what we're doing is that we have multiple workers, and I'll, I'll explain that at the end of the presentation. Basically, we have some internal consensus uh, algorithm that we use to allow multiple workers to compute each tasks. So instead of like picking one worker, as, I, as I'm kind of presenting here for simplicity, we have multiple workers computing each tasks, and that allows us to do like some kind of a voting, so that if one worker gives a result that that is different from the others, then we'll be able to catch that essentially. So that that's how the validation works. It's like a, an internal consensus on on each task. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. yeah. So there's different workers. Kind of the same yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's essentially like we have like right now I'm explaining as if there's one, but we're working on this kind of uh, internal consensus so that multiple workers can act as one, right? So every time that uh, a selection is being done, like so for every epoch we reshuffle the workers, we're gonna select multiple workers per contract. And that group of workers is going to essentially validate each other. So um, they're expected to all come to the same result. And if they don't, then you know, we'll be able to catch any um, false results. But also, we rely, um, we also rely on SGX a lot uh, to prove uh, certain things about correctness. That is not just like this kind of interactive verification of the results. Mm -hmm. then, then you must know, of course, Shadow attack, the the side yeah. attack, the, you know, um, that SGX is, you know, given the current state of SGX, is must be perfect. Yeah, we know that. I mean, <clears throat> so, like, two, there's a couple of things I can say about this. So, first of all, uh, these issues like, are kind of open research item. Uh, I mean, we're working really closely with Intel, so we're trying to at least know what the state of these things is, so at least we're aware of these attacks 
and the you know just the state of research around SGX. Also, like we're trying to do things to minimize uh, the severity of say one of these workers or multiple of these workers being compromised in that way. Uh, one of which is to um, externalize the key management module so that um, workers only get sort of the contract keys for a limited amount of time, basically only when they're being selected to work on that contract uh, and not the rest of the time, so that if there's an attack, then at least the damage are kind of limited. So like we're thinking that angle as well. And obviously the third angle is the MPC angle, where you know our first version isn't gonna include MPC for computing uh, each task, but this is something that we're working on right now and it's kind of a top priority, right? So if you had uh, the computation being done, say, by two workers with SGX, but also in an MPC fashion, where you know the, 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 the computation is split and not one enclave has all of the data, then that becomes a lot more robust. And there is also a benefit of using MPC with SGX because SGX still gives us some, some strong guarantees so that we could you know, have some smaller clusters and still be um, we still have a strong security there. So essentially like our goal is to basically combine both. We're starting with SGX, then we're moving towards MPC, and we think that having both makes a stronger solution than just having, uh, having MPC. Okay, what's MPC? Uh, MPC is a multi-party computation. So in a nutshell, and I'm not the MPC researcher, so you know, some of you guys might know more than I do about like, the details of it. But essentially, like conceptually, the idea is to take one computation with data and so forth, and to be able to split that computation into multiple chunks, where not one chunk has all of the has, has all of the data. So if one could have access to one of the chunks, it still wouldn't contain the full puzzle. So that still no crucial information will leak. So. That's kind of what MPC is in a nutshell. So with the idea of having multiple workers, then we can extend that so that instead of each worker computing the same thing, then each worker computes a chunk and then the results are, are aggregated at the end. So that means that if an enclave is compromised, then the, the data that leaks potentially is harmless. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you talked about like, having multiple workers basically do the same computation, so SGX would be essentially are assigned to the same contract, um, so if that's encrypted, then like how does the how does the user like essentially um, provide the key to to encrypt and decrypt that? Uh, well, I, I, I have a yeah. I have a slide up, I have a slide about this at the end, so I can cover it at that point. <clears throat> uh, does that all make sense to you guys so far? Or? Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. I just had one question. Yeah. Um, there's something in cryptography called like homophobic encryption, where it's like <laughs> homophobic. <laughs> homomorphic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what is homophobic? <laughs> Uh, homomorphic encryption where you're performing like computation on encrypted data. Yeah. So in this situation, um, are you guys using that sort of cryptography or is it just depend on the Intel SGX uh, nature? No, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a uh, cryptographer. My understanding is that this type of encryption isn't necessarily ready for prime time right now. It has kind of limited applications, but I think we're doing the second best thing, which is to combine secure multi-party computation with enclaves once we get to that point, uh, so that we can have secure multi-party computation, and on top of that, uh, each of the, the participants are secured by hardware. So it's, we think that it's probably as good as, we, as it gets in terms of encryption. But if you're aware of someone that has a general purpose, um, Technology that allows to to do what you're talking about, and we'd like to know about yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely experiment with that and see, like, 
what the limitations are. I'm sure there are some. Okay, so, uh, all right, moving on. Um, so, okay, as I mentioned, uh, the users, the DAP users, they use this JavaScript library and then they send computation tasks to the network. And one thing that happens when a computation task is sent to the network is there's also a task record being created on Ethereum. So essentially, like, sending a computation task to the network is kind of a two-step process. First, there's a, a record being created on Ethereum, and this is a very small record that contains just a couple of hashes. And we use that so that we can use Ethereum for, like, uh, to order the task and also for, for, for uh, final consensus. So like, if something is submitted to our network, we always validate against this task record to make sure that this task record exists. So that's like our current integration pattern with Ethereum. And the other thing you can do with this task record is you can um, attach some ERC20 tokens, for example. So in our secret contracts, we have some payable function that might accept like any ERC20 token. And the way that you would pass these tokens from um, from your Ethereum wallet to like the Enigma secret contract is by attaching them to this uh, task record. Of course, this is being done transparently. Like we have a JavaScript library that makes it kind of seamless, but that's essentially what's happening behind the scenes. So if you want to use the Enigma to like transfer some, some tokens, you can. We can put rules in secret contracts that tokens are going to be transferred to another address or call functions of Ethereum smart contracts. And this is being done by essentially depositing the token in the Enigma registry contract using the, these task records. So um, yeah, so each task on Enigma, at least currently, uh, does require a, a transaction on Ethereum. Uh, these, trans these task records can be created in batch. So if you have an application that kind of has to do multiple computation at once, then it could uh, create a batch of task records so sort of to, to speed up the, the process and also minimize the gas and stuff like that. Um, we're looking at ways that maybe like even we could, and that's not going to be out for the first uh, version, but we could, looking at ways that maybe we could use delegates also like to, to execute these transactions. Like, so perhaps the user just signs a raw transaction and then someone else commits that record to Ethereum, but that's not for now. Um, so essentially that's how it works. So like the task record is kind of the, the record, the official record of a task which is stored on Ethereum. And then um, each user, each DAP user, well, actually I'm gonna show you the next diagram. I think it explains this better. Mm. Uh, all right, so sorry about that. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk more about this process of sending a task in the next diagram. Um, but first, I wanna talk about a little bit like how SGX works. So essentially, one essential concept of SGX enclaves is this notion of, of a remote attestation. And this is critical, at least for this current SGX implementation, because uh, remote attestation is what we rely on to ensure that the workers who are running the computation are, are, are kind of safe, so to speak. So the way it works is, each, um, each node that will register to the Enigma network as a worker uh, will have um, an enclave, essentially. So to run Enigma's you know, client, you, to register as a node, uh, you need to have hardware with SGX enabled. Uh, SGX is available on a lot of the recent chips, Intel chips. Uh, I think from 2005 and on, some of the most recent chips have different features. Uh, there's actually a key feature on the 2018 chips that I'm just going to touch upon. Uh, but essentially, like, which is not going to be required initially, but it's going to be very handy for us. So essentially, like, uh, you need to, to run the node application. You need to have this uh, SGX Enclave enabled on your computer. Uh, you could use, there are some cloud providers that, that offer it, uh, Microsoft. Azure and also uh, IBM Cloud, whatever that's called. Um, so if you want to be a node, you have to have one of these. And also you need to have a um, EPID uh, associated with your enclave. So an EPID is an identifier that kind of 
uniquely identify your enclave, essentially. So these are the requirements kind of to be a, a, a node of the network. And then essentially what happens is that uh, when you register to the Enigma network to be a node, uh, essentially you do that by sending um, a transaction on Ethereum because as I mentioned earlier, like the, the list of uh, available workers or nodes are being tracked in a smart contract on Ethereum. So what you do is that you go through this process defined by Intel to get uh, a, a report. It's called, like, it's called a report. Um, and essentially the way it works is that we've written software to, to help with this. Like in our Enigma client, there's software that, that facilitates registration. So what you would do is that you would run the registration process in, in the software that we wrote. Then what that's gonna do is that it's gonna produce what's called a quote in your enclave. So an enclave that wants to be sort of authenticated produces what's called a quote, which is just like, you know, a cryptographic proof of some kind, uh, which is produced by the enclave and signed and everything. The enclave produces this quote, and then what we do is that we send this quote to this uh, ISV server, uh, which is hosted by Intel. So the purpose of this is that an SGX enclave produces a quote, sends that quote to Intel, and then Intel returns a report that says, yes, this is an authentic enclave, and it also offers other guarantees, like, for example, making sure that the code that runs on the enclave is only the code that's supposed to, like the Enigma um, client, for example. Uh, so basically, you send that quote to the verification service of Intel, you get a report in exchange, and that report is what we're committing to Ethereum during the registration process. Uh, right now in our MVT, the verification of that report is done by each user before submitting a computation to the network. So before submitting a computation to the network, each user knows which worker is gonna pick it so can verify it up front. Uh, but we're currently working on an on-chain verification mechanism uh, like using an RSA uh, library uh, for solidity. So, uh, on this, if, if all goes well, like the, the plan is to be able to, uh, unless we, we hit some road bumps with this, the plan is to be able to verify these reports as uh, each node registers as a worker to the network. So, essentially, you get that report from Intel and you send it to Ethereum as part of a sp special transaction. Ethereum does some cryptographic stuff with it, which is basically um, validate, verifies the signature that's embedded in the report, verifies that this signature um, uh, like is valid and c contains the data it's supposed to contain, and also does uh, an SSL root chain to make sure that the certificate uh, each certificate is like an X509 uh, certificate, so it, you know you can do a root chain to make sure that this this X, uh, sorry the the report is an X509 certificate, so you can do a root chain computation to make sure that this X509 report certificate came from Intel's you know CA trusted certificate and so forth. So basically, that's how it works. I I'm, I know I'm explaining this in a convoluted way, but essentially this is like an important cryptographic guarantee that we have because once we've done that, once we got the report from Intel and verified it and put it on the blockchain, the data that we're actually verifying with the signature is like an address which, is, which we call the signer address and then we know that afterwards any computation, any um, proof that's being sent to Ethereum which we call like a task receipt. So any proof that's being generated after computing a task is being signed by that address. And that, that's how we're kind of confirming that each computation have in fact been uh, executed by an enclave which hasn't been tampered with, which contains any must code and nothing else and so forth. So these are the kind of guarantees that, that, that we're relying on this right now. Uh, and what I wanted to say, that this is very exciting, uh, because uh, it, Intel just released some spec and some information. I read it, I, I have to read it like more than once, like to fully understand all of the details of it, uh, the implementation details, but they're kind of getting rid of 
the requirement to do this. So right now you have to use this uh, sort of centralized Intel server to verify your, your enclaves. But in the near future, I think, I think starting now with the chips that have been manufactured in 2018, uh, you'll be able to delegate other entities, presumably some of the registered, some of the worker registered on the Enigma network to do this verification. So Intel has built this library to be able to implement that and, and basically do that outside of just the uh, ISV server of Intel. So that's really good because it allows to decentralize this a lot more uh, and not rely on some kind of centralized server to verify the database. This isn't going to come in version one, but uh, the specs are already out, so like we're working on implementing it, and it's going to be there uh, like soon. Is this um, verification process to put out on the Apple's once, or do you, do, like, yeah. does that mean they like, have to redo that or something? No, it happens once. So as soon as it happens once, and as long as you sign your proofs with the address that's been verified, then then you're good. What if like? I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by, by, by compromise. Like, if the enclave gets compromised to the point that you're signing key, like the, the native key in the enclave is leaked, then we're in trouble. Like, all bets are off, basically. Because that signing key is very critical. Like, this is what allows the enclave to uh, prove anything. So if that signing key is compromised, then that's no good. Um, so, yeah. How is that possible? I don't know if that's, I don't think that's possible. I don't know about the, la the last attack. Um, I think it's not possible, but I'm not sure. If you guys know otherwise, just, just <laughs> well, listen. Because the attack was compromised. So were they, they blocking this? Because yes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, until recently, like all of the, the side channel attacks that had been found, like were kind of limited in scope. But there's a new one that's been found like last month, which is a bit more severe, uh, that could potentially leak, link, leak the signing key, but I'm not sure uh, about that one. And again, I'm not the one following up on it. Um, so, you know, I don't know all of the details. Uh, Guy, our, our founder, is, you know, much more uh, deeply involved with this, but I think the, the last one is pretty bad. So we'll have to make, sh you know, like basically this guy have to be uh, fixed one way or the other, or be, or someone is gonna have to prove that this is only a theoretical attack. But right now I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the status is of it. Mm. Uh, I'm saying it's actual attacks. Yeah. Like, you know, it doesn't it's not it's theoretical that essentially you're not Okay. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't done enough research in, in the side channel attack to understand the principle. Yeah, yeah that, that's my understanding as well. So I guess we'll have to see. But if the key is leaked, then, then you know, there's a big problem. <clears throat> the, the idea is the inherent problem with the GX is the problem with the because they, they share the, uh, the resources, right? They have a lot of resources to share. So that's good. Okay, um, so this diagram here just uh, explains with a little bit more details, like if this is kind of explaining the life cycle of a task, right? So how does, how does a task get created and where does it go and how does it um, get completed or, or verified? So this is what I was trying to explain earlier, but I think this diagram is explained a little bit better. So essentially, um, for each computation, the user, the DAP user that, that wants to originate each task will create a task record on Ethereum, plus provide the task input. So the key thing here is that on Ethereum, we're not storing the input of the computation, we're just storing a hash of the inputs, which from that record, you will be able to know if the inputs that you're seeing coming are, are the right ones or not, but we're not storing the inputs themselves. The task inputs are being encrypted by the DAP user, like in, in the, um, using the protocol that I described earlier, um, and sent to the Enigma network directly. So the way that the Enigma network works, again, it's like, it's a, it's, it's a 
connected network of nodes. Uh, we're using libp2p for those familiar with it to exchange messages in the network. So the way that would work is that the DAP user would be connected to a particular node of the network, will send his encrypted input to that node, and then that node will propagate these to other nodes uh, until essentially uh, the selected worker gets them. So we're, we're using the network to propagate the inputs in that way. When the selected worker or workers get the input, um, then that worker would have the encryption key required to decrypt them, as I was explaining earlier. And also, um, that worker will be able to um, access the state of the contract. So, so the way it works is that each contract has a state, as I mentioned earlier, like you can save some attributes of a secret contract. And the way that these attributes are being saved is in the form of state deltas. So every time that uh, a worker executes a computation, uh, there are side effects, essentially. Uh, these side effects are like for each computation, you may have uh, essentially outputs, like a return statement. So for example, if I'm a user and I call, I, I create a task, meaning calling a function of a secret contract, that secret contract might have a return statement where we want to return some values. So these are the outputs of a computation, and these outputs will go back to the DAP user. So essentially, these outputs will follow the reverse encryption scheme. So these outputs will be now encrypted using the user public key and the private encryption key, or, or a, key, a key derived from the user public key and the private encryption key, and flow through the network back to the node that the user is connected to so that the user can access those output. So basically, what's being returned by the return statement of the function of the secret contract specified in the task. So this is for the outputs. But also, uh, if your secret contract has a state, so ha like has some attributes that store some values, like in the case of a voting contract, I don't know, like there might be the everyone's vote and you don't want to return that to the user every time. So she want to keep it in the state. So what will happen is that what happens is that we're calculating a state delta. So the the worker knows the current state of the contract. So for, for this example, let's suppose that it's a brand new contract and I'm sending the first task that goes in this contract. So the state of the contract is empty. So what's gonna happen is the worker would have like an empty state for the contract and then I send a task, the, the worker computes it and the function that's attached to the task, uh, does uh, include some business logic that modifies the state, then what would happen is a state delta will be generated. And the state delta is like a patch, essentially it's a CRUD operation against the state. So it will specify like whether some data was added to the state and where and so forth. And what we do is that, one, we keep this in memory until the worker is the selected worker. So basically, like the worker always keeps a copy of the state in memory so that when it receives the next task, it has the latest state. But also, uh, we encrypt the state delta and dispatch it uh, across the network. And that's how the state is stored, essentially. So each node who might, and, and there's a process to determine which node gets which delta, I, I don't want to go into that right now, but essentially like each node that gets, that received the state delta for a given contract, will store like a bunch of encrypted state deltas. Uh, and when that node is being selected as a worker for this particular contract, it will take all of its state delta. It will say, okay, I just got selected as a worker. An epoch just ended, I got selected, now I'm gonna uh, perform computations for this particular contract. Then the worker will take all of the state delta that it has in storage encrypted and replay them in the enclave and essentially reconstitute the full state in the enclave. So the decrypted state is only available inside of, of an enclave and never outside. And the data that's stored outside of an enclave is an encrypted state delta, which basically is CRUD operation against the state that you can replay at any time. So that's kind of how it works, like with the state. So that's what I'm saying. Every time there's a computation, you may have two side effects, one, the results, to the state deltas, 
and I'm kind of, kind of trying to explain how the, these are being handled. Uh, there's another side effect that can exist that I didn't model in here, I probably should have, but essentially another side effect might be Ethereum calls. So in our smart contract language, we're allowing, for now, we're only allowing this as the last line of a, uh, of a um, secret contract function. Like for obvious reasons, like we don't have yet an asynchronous like wait in and out of a function, but essentially like at the end of a, of a secret contract function, you are able to call a, an Ethereum contract. So this is very useful because say for example, you have, a, I don't know, some TCR application already on Ethereum and you want to use Enigma for specific things like maybe to tally the votes, then you want to be able to return the result straight to your uh, Ethereum contract and not have the user receive it and, and trust that he's gonna commit it. So you want to be able to sometimes uh, send computation results straight to Ethereum, so we allow that. So our smart contract language allows to call an Ethereum function at the end, and you can call basically any function of any smart contract, uh, loosely I guess, like, um, yeah, as long as it's a public function, it will work. Uh, and you can also, uh, uh, that function can also accept ERC20 tokens, because as I mentioned earlier, it's possible to kind of lock your C20 tokens inside of a secret contract and kind of unlock it later in that manner. So if you do that, if you have this kind of call in your secret contract, there's going to be a third, third side effect, which is going to be essentially a list of encoded Ethereum calls. So that's going to be a kind of a third type of output uh, coming out of your, of your computation task. Now, okay, so now this is defined. So we have our task, we know what the inputs are, we define what kind of outputs are there. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce the concept of batch. So essentially, if, so first I'm going to talk about the use case where you don't have these Ethereum uh, side effect, like you have computations that don't call Ethereum. Suppose that's the case, then what could happen is during the epoch, during each epoch, a user could go and send like five computations to the network for simplicity's sake, let's assume there's only one worker, but this also works with multiple, but like, we just assume for now there's one worker. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Can we define an epoch? Uh, an epoch is a number of blocks on Ethereum configurable. Right. How, how, exactly. so how, do you, how do you pick an epoch? We haven't necessarily picked the length yet. It's going to be like a parameter when the contract is deployed. Is that, is that a, a, are you finding it because you want to make sure that uh, the finality uh, aspect, if there is something that you need to do, yeah. data that you need to have to address the initial finality. So now you're picking an epoch, that's sort of the data that you finalize from whatever block. I think, uh, I'm not sure, like basically the purpose, like the finality is basically done on Ethereum, right? Like that's our final uh, consensus. And the reason why we have epochs is to be able to rotate the workers, because otherwise, like you would pick, say, yeah, it will be always the same worker or it will be always the same group of worker per contract and there will never be rotation. So if you got lucky enough to be selected as the crypto kitty on Enigma, you know, secret contract, you're gonna make tons of money and it'll be good forever. You know, so that, that's kind of the, the reason why we have these epochs. It's actually complicating things in terms of finality because the epochs end, so we have to make sure that uh, the tasks that were assigned during that epoch get finalized and, and there, there's some complications associated with it, but that's the reason why we have them. Um, and yeah, and uh, and yeah, and ultimately, a batch might exist within an epoch. Like we don't have batch across epochs, and the purpose of a batch would be that if my users submit many computations to this, let's assume there's only one worker selected for now, to this one selected worker, then this one selected worker can uh, compute all of these tasks sequentially without having to report to Ethereum every, every time. So that allows that worker to compute uh, stuff much faster because you don't have to always um, rely on Ethereum for consensus. So essentially what will happen in this case is that uh, the task will be sent to Enigma, um, the worker will compute them, and the task output will go to the user as soon as they're completed. So the, the, the user will be able to get the results like fast, even before they're confirmed on Ethereum. 
And then once the batch closes, and there are two events that, like there are two events that will essentially force the batch to be committed on Ethereum. Either the epoch ends, or uh, one of the uh, tasks that's part of the batch has one of these Ethereum calls. If that's the case, then uh, the, the network would take all of the tasks that came before that, that task that has the Ethereum call and then commit them as a batch. So that's kind of what defines when batch are being committed. So it's still gonna be committed pretty frequently, presumably, uh, because we have to account for these uh, Ethereum side effects. So it's not gonna be just one per epoch, but it, it, will be, it will be a lot faster than if we had to commit every uh, single task uh, on Ethereum for consensus. Yep. Uh, I don't think so, but c can you? Uh, I don't understand. I guess the uh, the use case that you're describing. Oh, for example, so if if the contract, contract is a year to year contract, or if it is a contract, uh, it's a tokenized uh, swap, for example, yeah. I want to see who owns what. Uh, would this this be exactly the same? Yeah, I th there's no like real differences between being a contract owner or being a user. Uh, if you're a contract owner in your secret contract, you may have some modifiers, you know, like on Ethereum, so that only you can do certain operations, but the flow of a task isn't going to be any different. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -mm. No, no human, and that's the point, right? No human should have access to the data, and that's a really critical point, because otherwise it's no better than an AWS server where the admin has access and might leak it on the dark net or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. The, there's no like at the moment, at least, uh, in the incarnation of our network. Like we're, we're kind of like building some. We're building some building blocks, and eventually, like we'll have our own ledger. But right now, we don't. So there's no concept of an Enigma address. An address is an Ethereum address, but you can reference it in uh, Enigma secret contract. And you know the reason why we're building it this way also is. Like we really want to be a very usable solution for existing uh, Ethereum dApps that you can kind of put in and it's fairly transparent for the end user. Um, so that's why we don't have like these separate deposits, these separate addresses and so forth. Like we try to make it as much as possible, possible to send something that looks like a regular Ethereum transaction, uh, but that's private and that can be can contain a lot more load, you know, like contain a lot more data, a lot more extensive computation, and can, can so we're at 8.30, mm -hmm. I want to make sure you get through all the contents, and there's other questions, I can ask you guys to hold on until we're at the bar. I just want to make sure that we get through all the contents. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, okay, so. Five if possible, because you can hear them throwing away our Okay, fine. so. Um, I mean, if everyone's happy to stay, they're going to have to stay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty much, I think I'm done with like all of the key concepts. I just wanted to flash this diagram quick, quickly, which isn't very detailed because I, frankly we're still working some of the details uh, on this, but uh, this is basically representing the internal consensus that we have for, because so far I was trying to assume that there's only one worker selected per contract per epoch, but obviously that's not the implementation that we want to go for, it's multiple workers. So we're building this kind of consensus where um, multiple workers can be selected to work on a contract at the same time, and essentially what will happen is that they would share these state deltas, like basically they would all run the computation, share the state deltas, and in a way that do, does something like a proof of, uh, proof of replication where we have something in we have some properties of the consensus that ensures that every node selected actually got the state deltas um, and 
can cross validate and, and so forth. So um, though if I wanna, you know, there, if I need to provide a lot of details on that, but essentially you are just, this is an interesting problem that, that we're currently working on to grab a pretty good solution for it. Um, that will allow us to use like multiple worker kind of working together as one and this kind of consensus is uh, super fast. Um, so that, that will be pretty, uh, pretty good. So we'll be able to have multiple workers and what this prevents is for example, if we had just one worker per uh, computation, then there's two major issues with this. One, that guy could decide to go offline and you never hear from him or it could decide to throttle the computations or maybe it could be compromised. Where with this, if a worker doesn't sign the messages fast enough, then it's just dropped from the from the cluster, and the other workers continue uh, working on the computation. So this is a way to incentivize workers, like to basically. Would a new worker be assigned? Uh, the worker is dropped. Is, I actually, to be honest with you, we haven't finalized that detail yet as as to whether we need to. Uh, assign a new worker to a group, or if we just continue the group like handicapped by one, uh, I, I I don't know. It's not final. It's not a final decision yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it for me. I think covered all of the essential.